Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, you're very welcome to today. Um, so we're going to be here for probably about the next, just over the next hour. Um, and my name is Heather Tuckington and I am one of the organizers of today's event. So I'm a drama therapist and I work in County Armagh in a nursing and residential setting with men of all ages living with mental ill health. So just a bit about me. I am the Northern Irish link person for BADTA, the British Association of Drama Therapists. I'm a council member for IACAT, the Irish Association of Creative Arts Therapists, and a representative for drama therapy within AHP FNI, the Allied Health Professions Federation of Northern Ireland. I've been working full-time as a drama therapist since I gained my HCPC registration, and I graduated from the National University of Maynooth in Kildare with my master's in drama therapy in 2018. So before we start, just a note, if you are on social media at all, we'd love if you could take a second or two now or after um, the event, um, if you could Facebook, Instagram, or tweet about today using the hashtag clinically creative, that would be brilliant. So thank you so much to everyone for being here. We've been blown away by the amount of interest and support, and we are so grateful to everyone for giving their time, whether it be attendance, organization, or both, especially at the moment, considering the huge pressures that everyone is under. Thank you to Jenny Kane, our Chief Allied Health Professions Officer, and Peter McCauley, our Deputy Capo, for giving up their time today. Thank you also to the representations of our professions who have joined us, including from the British Association of Art Therapists, the British Association of Drama Therapists, and the British Association for Music Therapy, who have generously donated their Zoom account for today's event. Thank you also to the Irish Association of Creative Arts Therapists who represent and support music, art, drama, dance and movement and expressive arts therapists in the Republic of Ireland. And to the ambassadors, Pat Bracken and Molly Lynch, all of whom have been very, very supportive of today's event as well. A massive thank you to our wonderful speakers from each of the three allied health professions involved without whom today could not have happened. And a bit of housekeeping. We didn't want to limit the numbers for today, but it does mean that there are quite a few of us here. So please do keep yourselves on mute. Feel free to use the chat function to chat or to ask questions. There will be time allocated after all the speakers to answering as many questions from the chat as possible. If your question is directed towards a particular speaker or profession, do mention that when typing your question. We are recording the event today with the help of our invaluable tech and moral support team consisting of fellow drama therapist and IACAD council member, Kira O'Sullivan, and their wonderful technolo technological genius, Stephen Rice. We hope to make the edited recording available after the event. Links to this and any relevant or requested information will be sent out via email. If you are struggling to see who is currently speaking, please ensure you have clicked on speaker view on your own Zoom. Finally, I am very aware that we have many creative arts therapists joining us today. If you are one of them and you know how to, might I suggest that you use the rename function in your Zoom to include your modality. For example, my name would show Heather Turkington, drama therapist. It's so lovely to have you here as part of the Creative Arts Therapies family, as well as everyone here, both interested and supportive. So I'm now going to pass you over to today's wonderful co-organizer and music therapist, Jenny Kirkwood, to introduce herself and tell you a little bit more about today. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Jenny Kirkwood, as Heather said. I am a trustee of the British Association for Music Therapy and um, joint Northern Ireland rep, along with my colleague Emma Donnelly, who's on maternity leave at the moment. Um, I am going to give you a, a brief introduction of the three arts therapies, music therapy, art therapy and drama therapy. And then we're going to have, as Heather said, a series of short presentations of work from the three professions. Um, of course, we won't have time today to cover sort of the full range of areas that we do work in, but um, hopefully the presentations will give you a good sort of overall flavour of the work that we do. Um, essentially, music, art and drama therapists are both therapists, clinicians and artists, and we use our art forms as a means to provide clinical treatment. 
Art therapists use visual arts as a form of psychotherapy to encourage clients to explore issues, communicate and express themselves. In drama therapy, the performance arts are utilised within the therapeutic relationship to engage clients in affecting psychological, emotional and social changes through an indirect approach. Music therapists engage service users in musical interaction using both existing pre-composed music and also newly created or improvised music so as to improve an individual's emotional, psychological, physical health and well-being. Music, art and drama therapists are registered with the HCPC, so it's a protected title. We're part of that wider family of the allied health professions, but we're also psychological therapies. Our entry level is a master's qualification, so it's an advanced practice. Um, for example, the music therapy people will usually have a primary degree in music and then proceed to a master's in music therapy, or they may have a degree in uh, a related subject such as psychology, but a high level of musicianship, and the equivalent of that goes um, for art and drama therapy. Um, in Northern Ireland at the moment, you can take uh, a master's MSc in art psychotherapy at Ulster University, but there aren't currently any training courses in music or drama therapy. This obviously has a huge impact on the professions in Northern Ireland. Um, and there's always great interest and lots of inquiries from prospective students, but if they want to pursue the professions, they have no choice but to move away from Northern Ireland to do that. This is uh, an overview of the status of the arts therapies in Northern Ireland currently. The, this data is taken from the, our workforce review report, which was completed in 2019 with the Department of Health, and also from a freedom of information request that was made to the HCPC in 2019. So there are 33 HCPC registered uh, music therapists in Northern Ireland currently. None are employed directly by health and social care, but approximately 26% or thereabouts of music therapy work in Northern Ireland is funded through health and social care, through sort of ongoing subcontracting or procurement arrangements. There are uh, 42 HCPC registered art therapists who are members of BAT, the professional body, and 15 non-members, and about 44 trainee art therapists. Um, but there are two and a half whole-time equivalent art, uh, art therapists employed in the Western Trust and the Belfast Trust. And there are eight um, HCPC registered drama therapists in Northern Ireland, and again, none that are employed directly by health and social care in Northern Ireland. Um, this is a, an overview of the clinical areas that we work in. As you can see, it's a very wide range. Um, unlike some of the other allied health professions, we're not defined by the outcome area that we work in, but rather by the modality that we use, music, art or drama. So the clinical outcomes that we work on can be very wide ranging. You know, they can be physical, social, emotional, psychological, cognitive, communication based um, and so on. So we work in uh, physical sensory learning disability and um, we work with people with communication disorders. We work in uh, mental health services or to support people's sort of emotional, psychological and social well-being, for example, with uh, children looked after. We work in the uh, treat, we work in treatment and rehabilitation of neurological conditions, so such as stroke rehabilitation um, with people with Parkinson's or MND. Um, we work with people with uh, disorders of consciousness or acquired brain injury. Um, and there's also now the consideration, um, as we know, of long COVID rehabilitation as well. Um, we work with people with dementia in palliative care and end of life care and bereavement support in forensic settings and in acute medical settings such as children's hospitals, oncology or the neonatal ICU. So as you can see, it's a very, very wide range of areas that we that we do work in. So um, just to take a few minutes to think why you use the arts in healthcare, why would you use the arts as your vehicle or means to provide a clinical treatment uh, aimed at improving health? So being creative, and engaging in creative activities to improve well-being and quality of life is one of the things that's at the very root of what makes us human. I'm sure we've all felt um, the last 12 months the lack of access to creative activity, so concerts, uh, being in a choir, going to classes, going on trips to the theatre. Um, I'm sure we've all felt that very clean, keenly in the last 12 months, especially in the arts activities that we can turn to at home, like listening to music or making our own art or watching films have been some of the things that have sort of helped to keep us all going. Um, the role of the arts in people's lives to enhance um, well-being is indisputable. 
Of course, to engage in music or art or drama therapy doesn't require service users to have any particular skill or any particular previous experience in music, art or drama. And that, that sort of very human instinct to use the arts to improve our quality of life isn't impaired or affected by any illness or injury or disability. Obviously, there are multitudes of types of music and art and drama and likewise multitudes of ways that people can participate in them and this gives the arts therapies as a, a clinical approach a very high degree of accessibility and flexibility in how we can very much tailor the art forms to each and every individual person to meet their needs and that gives us great sort of gives us that great breadth and depth of our scope of practice and um, across all of those groups of service users that that I mentioned before. Um, this also means that we can provide a, a form of therapeutic support that can be accessed by people with the most complex needs, you know, needs that can sometimes be difficult to address in, in other settings. Um, I am going to pass over now to uh, my music therapy colleagues, first and foremost. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Lauren and then we're going to hear from Andrea. Hello everybody, hopefully um, you can see my screen now, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, super. So my name is Lauren Davison and I am a music therapist and um, working at Everyday Harmony or formerly known as Northern Ireland Music Therapy Trust. I'm going to be talking today about um, some upcoming work um, that we have a singing group for pulmonary rehabilitation. So um, Everyday Harmony was approached by a pulmonary physiotherapist in the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust who asked us to set up and to lead an online singing rehabilitation group aimed at individuals who had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, chronic lung disease and other breathing issues. So um, there are 15 to 20 individuals that will be taking part in this small group. They will attend a 45 minute Zoom session once a week for six weeks initially. The sessions will involve physical and vocal warm ups, breath control exercises, and group singing of songs specifically chosen by the music therapist with an aim to aid breath control, to reduce feeling of shortness of breath, and also to help them feel more in control of their breathing. It will help to promote relaxation as well as a sense of well-being. In the current lockdown situation, it also aims to be a fun group activity to reduce socialisation and loneliness with an opportunity to learn new skills and songs. Prior to the sessions commencing and after the six weeks, the individuals will complete a questionnaire from ourselves and the physiotherapist. This will be adapted um, from the St George questionnaire and the HADS questionnaire, aiming to inform us about how breathing affects their well-being and everyday life, as well as to measure their clinical outcomes of the group. These findings will then be evaluated. So singing is a complex physical activity. It involves breath, posture, voice control and the active use of respiratory muscles. Singing can help those with lung conditions to reduce the feeling of shortness of breath, feel more in control of their breathing and also to help them manage their symptoms better. This can be done by teaching individuals to breathe more slowly and deeply, along with improving their posture to help with more efficient breathing. Warm-ups at the start of the session will, will help to prepare the body for activity and also to get the individuals ready to sing. Vocal exercises such as rhythm and pitch games will involve tongue twisters, singing up and down notes of the scale to different vowels, closed mouth singing, as well as clapping, swaying and other body movements. In some lung conditions like COPD, the airways are narrowed or obstructed. This can make it difficult for them to empty air out of their lungs when the individual breathe out and the air gets trapped in their lungs. If they do not empty their lungs efficiently, they will only be able to top up their breath using the top of their chest to breathe instead of their whole lungs. This uses muscles in the neck and shoulders, which can get tired quickly. 
Singing familiar songs along with long phrases helps to lengthen the out breath and to empty their lungs. This helps to reduce the amount that muscles are used in the neck and shoulders when taking the next breath in and therefore saving energy and making breathing more comfortable. When singing songs, individuals are focused on the words and the melody and therefore aren't consciously thinking about their breathing. Songs sung in a call and response format also work well as they mean that individuals listen and repeat what the leader sings without having to read lyrics or think about what is coming next. So there have been positive outcomes found in similar work such as this um, by the British Lung Foundation with their Singing for, for Lung Health programme. Other research by Lewis et al, Lord et al and Skinley et al have also looked into the effect that singing can have with those with COPD and chronic respiratory disease. Um, Lewis et al's participants found that singing helps um, them to manage their breathlessness, improves their quality of life, mood and activities of daily living and participation um, in social activity and physical activity. Sorry. No one at all found that singing contributed to an increased sense of breath control and ability to control breathlessness. And Skinley et al found that participants describe their mental health and physical benefits, including learning how to breathe properly, also improved posture as well as social benefits. So these singing groups and the song group that we will be doing is an example of how music therapy can address clinical outcomes, but at the same time provide a motivating and enriching form of therapy that can also improve general emotional and psychological well-being. So looking towards the future, these singing groups have the potential to be rolled out long term across Northern Ireland, both online and hopefully very soon in person. They could also play a role in other areas such as COVID-19 recovery, as we know that some individuals who have had COVID-19 have experienced the long-term effects of feeling breathlessness after they have had the illness. And there's a few references which can be shared for those who need it. Thank you so much for listening and I will now pass you on to Andrea. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrea Harbinson and I have been working in Northern Ireland as a music ther therapist for the last 18 years. Um, I have worked in a wide range of areas, um, children, adolescents, and currently I'm working in an adult unit. Um, so thank you for asking me to come and my presentation today focuses on aspects of my work as a music therapist um, with patients with alcohol-related brain injury. I work for an organisation called Leonard Cheshire, um, and this unit that I work in is a 14-bedded neuro rehab unit, um, speci specifically designed for patients with alcohol-related brain injury. The average age of the patient is between 45 and 75, um, and the unit is relatively newly opened um, and it opened in January of 2020, just before lockdown. The aims of the unit um, are to enable patients to live more independently by rebuilding essential life skills they have lost due to their alcohol related brain injury. They aim to address the individual issues of alcoholism and addiction that brought them to the point of brain injury in the first place. So briefly what I would, before I go on to talk about the benefits of music therapy, I would like to give you some idea of what a patient with brain injury presents with. Um, and as you can see, there are four main areas. There's the actual acute brain injury in terms of vascular disease. Um, and this is um, specifically related to, to thiamine deficiency um, in terms of excessive alcohol consumption. But alongside that runs the parallel of the brain injury associated with complex um, post-traumatic stress disorder and um, adverse life experiences. Um, so these patients present with um, specific memory and mood disorders. 
um, related to episodic memory in terms of being able to remember their past. Um, they present with a specific syndrome called Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome, which involves involuntary eye movements, poor balance, staggering gait, confusion and confabulation. And if the alcohol um, related brain injury isn't um, diagnosed within a certain time, this also can progress on to what's called a, a Korsakoff psychosis, um, where these patients um, have this an inability to actually remember their past. Um, and what they do is they confabulate stories that they think have happened. Um, they also present them with neurological syndromes in terms of difficulties with walking, speech and movement. So I suppose then the question is, what does music do for that? What does music in itself bring um, to working with patients um, with brain injury? And just to say that um, neuro research and neuroscience has shown that music is a whole brain phenomena. Um, what I have here is a picture of um, functional MRI picture of the brain showing um, the, the areas within the brain that are highlighted um, when the brain has been auditory stimulated by music. Um, and you can see the many areas within the brain in terms of frontal lobe, in terms of executive functioning, in terms of speech and language, in terms of sensory motor areas within the brain that are specifically highlighted when patients both listen to music and um, participate in, in musical interaction. So music therapy then, what is it? What is it on a day-to-day -day basis we do? Um, we have already heard that it's a clinical training. Um, music therapy is a psychological and neurological therapy that uses unique qualities of music as a means of interaction between therapist and patient. It also involves um, specific attentive listening on the part of the therapist and is combined with shared musical experiences that we use using musical instruments and our voices. It's uh, patient-led similarly to counselling and psychotherapy in terms of what the patient brings to us. Um, and we work both individually with patients and we work in small groups within the unit. So what do these instruments look like? Um, lots of um, people that I've spoken to say, well, how does that work if you don't play a musical instrument? Um, and I think the key to that is, is that we provide musical instruments that are accessible to all, drums, guitars, uh, bells. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a wide range. But I think central to all of the work that we do is how the music therapy work is established, the relationship is established, and how this is developed through engagement and live musical interaction and play between a therapist and the patient. We use techniques such as therapeutic singing, musical speech stimulation, rhythmical based activities, improvisation, composition, songwriting, imagery based experiences. And one main area that I have found really useful in working with this particular client cohort is the use of song. Um, and thinking from a psychodynamic perspective, that song um, works as a projection of feelings uh, within a musical framework. Um, it provides a container for the projections and identification of emotions. And indeed, when I was um, working with one of my, my individual patients yesterday, um, we have been working through lots of issues of loss and bereavement. And he said to me, you know, songs can hold and can and carry a significant amount of heartache. And I thought that was just a really good statement that portrayed the value of song within music therapy. Um, songs bear witness to our lives. They relive the past, they can examine the present, and they can give voice to our future dreams. So in terms of working within the unit, the work that I do is a hybrid approach. I work from a psychotherapeutic framework, a relational approach. I think about the trust and transference. I, th 
I think about the quality of the relationship in terms of attachment styles and containment. I work within a consistent dynamic framework of time, place and session length. I consider um, aspects of my listening in terms of explicit and implicit content of what the patient brings to my music therapy session in terms of conscious meaning and unconscious meaning. And then the aspects of affect attunement that we can be um, brought right back to early relational patterns in terms of mirroring, matching, sound and silence. And also then within the, the associative potential of imagery that is brought through song and what the patient brings in their verbal um, responses. So alongside that then, I, I, I I'm constantly bearing in mind the neurorehabilitation aspect of working with my patients, um, focusing on cognition um, and executive function dysregulation in terms of their attention skills. How can they focus their attention? Can they divide their attention? Can they alternate their attention? Um, memory skills in terms of rhythmic patterns that are initiated and responded to. Um, planning and organization that is all part of a rhythmic experience um, and that there's clear beginnings and clear endings. So I feel as if I am coming to the end of my talk and I feel as if it has been a whirlwind experience but hopefully has given you some insight into the work that I do in this alcohol related brain injury unit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea and Lauren. That was a wonderful insight into music therapy. And it's really wonderful seeing all your intros and your conversation and your comments in the chat. So be sure to remember to put any of your questions for the end in the chat as well. Um, so now I'm going to pass you over to my drama therapy colleagues and uh, that's going to be Louise Coombs and Maeve Iver. So I'll pass you over to them now. How drama therapy offers diversity and improves health, mental health outcomes quickly in difficult to treat populations. This is a psychosocial solution. So just to give you a bit of background about myself, I worked for Comet Relief and was involved in identifying projects that really made a difference. And that's how I became a drama therapist because I was so impressed with the impact it had and I've been registered um, as a drama therapist with the HCPC since, uh, since then. And for the last nine years, I've worked in early intervention in psychosis, which is basically a wraparound men medical and social support for people after an episode, after a single episode. And in that time, I've been looking at the impact and how we engage disabled clients. And that's been partly supported by a Health Education England internship um, in 2016. And what I noticed was that there wasn't really any research happening with the client population that we work with, uh, because they're difficult to uh, include in research. Um, it's very complex. But the thing is that although these people are at the margins, they end up costing a lot to services if they're not properly understood. And so the work we do, although it, it may be with small numbers, it's really important and it can cost services a lot if they aren't having people work with these people. Um, the details about that work is included at the website here um, on the NICE best practice site and I've also include um, I've also uh, produced a couple of pieces of writing there's a case study in the bad the journal and there's a chapter in the practical guide to hearing voices which is just coming out shortly and I offer supervision and support for setup of similar services um, and the case study that I'm talking about was included recently in the allied health professions quick guide uh, this is what they said, of 122 people aged 14 to 65 who engaged with drama therapy in the last five years, 
45% had set a goal or progressed to mainstream services within two to six sessions, which they previously would not have been able to do due to communication issues. Drama therapy provided increased access to psychological therapies and stabilized clients through trauma-informed approaches that incorporate the body and the mind. Approximately 20% of people accessing the service were identified as having communication problems that made engagement difficult in standard treatment pathways like talking therapies. Unrecognized and untreated, individuals can be isolated and the service can waste resources offering inappropriate interventions. Just to explain that a little bit clearer and simpler, if we took a we took our first sample of 18 service users, the first people who engaged, and we followed them through the service and found at discharge that they had met their own goals. So three were living completely independently for the first time in their lives. Six were attending university or college. 13 felt that they'd improved social contact. And eight were job seeking or in work. And I think most importantly, perhaps, is that 17 out of the 18 had had no relapse at all. And let's remember that psychosis is a precursor to schizophrenia. So the purpose of the service is to prevent people developing schizophrenia, which is when you, uh, when you, when you keep having psychotic episodes. And this chart here shows how we'd avoided that. Uh, it's insignificant when you think that most of the people have comorbidity. So they're dealing with psychosis and some other complex diagnosis and often undiagnosed issues that are combined with psychosis. Put another way, uh, we measured the social and occupational functioning assessment at before drama therapy and afterwards. And consistently over that 13 years, there was a 13 point improvement for all clients. To quote the AHP guide, drama therapy allows people to engage at their own pace on their terms and to experience success early on without necessarily having to talk. It improves their ability to reflect, to communicate their thoughts and feelings. This in turn improves their relationship with the service and helps personalise their care. So how does it work? To quote one client, you gave me the power. And these are the principles that we operate in early intervention psychosis. We provide people with a taster session where they have the power. They don't have to sign up to it. They just come along and try it out. And over time, they can they control what happens in the session uh, and also how frequently the sessions are. The, when I say choice, they can control the material. They control whether we work with their body, because quite a lot of people through trauma can't really settle. Uh, and, and so we look at uh, calming the trauma through breathing, relaxation, body scan work. We might project onto objects, ideas, and that can help articulate metaphors that we can co-produce over time. And we might look at role relationships, loosening long learned narratives of failure, giving people opportunities to have new narratives in their lives and a new perspective on roles, what they want more or less of. And this ties in with the idea of, of being with in neuroscience evidence rather than talking at. Just to point out who it works for, um, over three days work a week uh, in that five year period, 142 people tried drama therapy and 122 engaged. 45% of those moved on within six sessions. So it was just about goal setting and that, and that, and that was achieved. 39% continued to group, 16% continued with individual therapy. And this was, was, was really without any difficult, complicated language. It was very much coming with what they brought, which is why it speaks to the health inequalities framework that we're currently working with. I think it works really well for people for whom English isn't necessarily their first language. And that's reflected in the figures between 50 and 80% of the people who engage with drama therapy are black Asian minority ethnic groups. And about one in five also has a complex additional need. 
And just to give you an idea of what we mean by that, so so this is a, a, one of the people that we worked with who's given us permission to use their words. When he arrived, he was he described himself as a misanthrope, and he was the service were concerned about his aggression, and it was taking a lot of service time. There were evidence of quite a lot of neglect and undiagnosed issues. Time was spent seeing if he had autism, but he didn't. He just really hated groups and, and later admitted he'd attended individual drama therapy because actually he was fearful for his liver. He needed to find a way to attend a 16-week residential detox where he had to actually stay on site in a group, which was his absolute fear. So drama therapy gave him the ability to create his own coping strategies for being with other people. And, and this is one that he shared. This is, this is one he'd invented after drama therapy. And it was about velociraptors in Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park and how he'd use this metaphor to keep himself safe. I've seen Jurassic Park where they say, don't move because they can't see you if you don't move. That's what I say to myself as I walk past them. Don't get me wrong. I don't like cowards. Sorry. I don't like crowds, but I do go out and shop and I can handle it. Jurassic Park is like a joke in my head. I'm confident. I feel confident to attend detox. I'm now sober. I now attend AA groups. I can now publicly speak. Drama th therapy made it more possible. Drama therapy is much better than CBT is. I found it weird and some it stuck. Drama therapy is more entertaining. You learn more when you're entertained. And another very different kind of client. So Zuki was someone who was living with severe depression and was very new to voice hearing. And that was very debilitating for her. This is what she said about engaging in body work. There are so many thousands of emotions that are not represented in language. Now I realize that I can identify them without words. If I identify the emotions non-verbally, they may not progress to voices and certainly they don't get strong. In group, when I get voice attacks out of nowhere and I'm feeling depressed, someone gives you a chunk of their emotions through action. You get their movement, it takes you to a new place you've never experienced before. Over time, this helps you become more fluid. Um, and Zuki shared, very kindly shared her explanation in the Practical Handbook of Hearing Voices, which is soon to be published. Um, and so I think that pretty much explains how drama therapy works in our service. It fits alongside talk, talking therapies, which are definitely a useful, important approach, but we need to be diverse. In July 2020, King's Fund commissioned a survey of GPs, and they found that there was a strong feeling that complex needs were not being met in mental health services. People with psychosis do not fulfill the criteria for IAPT. And at that time, and things have got certainly worse, 26% of referrals to CAMS were rejected. Post-COVID, self-harm in children appears to have doubled. So it's all the more important to find quick interventions that can help people. And I present drama therapy as one of those. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes. Uh, my name is Maeve Ivers and can everyone hear me okay? Thank you. Um, I'm a HCPC registered drama therapist and clinical supervisor and I'm a member of the British Association of Drama Therapists. Um, after qualifying in drama therapy in London, I, I returned to Northern Ireland in 2006. And when I returned to Northern Ireland, drama therapy was a profession that was hardly known when I moved here. I found work mostly in special needs in primary schools, community therapy services, including suicide prevention and trauma recovery, and working privately with children and adults with learning disabilities, autism and complex needs. I would like to reiterate Louise's points that by combining movement, metaphor and enactment, drama therapy can help patients whose presentations 
make them difficult to reach due to a complexity of diagnosis or communication difficulties or both. And because drama therapy validates and engages the client's own chosen language, such as movement or idiosyncratic speech, it meets them where they need to be met. Now, here are two brief examples of work that I have delivered as a freelance drama therapist in Northern Ireland for the trusts. One is an example of a short intervention and one a long-term intervention. First, I worked with one woman in a community mental health service for eight sessions who had been suffering from postnatal psychosis and depression. And she was not finding current treatment that was being offered useful for her. After engaging in eight drama therapy sessions where she was able to use movement and explore her experience metaphorically, she reported a relief from her symptoms and a greater ability to cope. She then went on to engage with the service that the community mental health team were providing for her. A longer term intervention, again, as a freelance drama therapist for the trust, is one like a young woman with autism and complex physical health and psychological needs who was referred to me six years ago as she did not leave her home and she had difficulty keeping her eyes open for sustained periods. She was deemed unsuitable for the day services that were usually provided. Having worked with her weekly over six years, both alongside an art therapist, a music therapist, and an occupational therapist, she is now more able to manage transitions both through her house and out of her house she is also able to hold her eyes open for sustained periods and pick things up with her hands. She engaged in, in an indirect and embodied approach, which helped her. And this is an example of how drama therapy can offer a distinctive service to reach people who may be harder to reach. Finally, I'd like to leave you with some parent feedback. It's a short clip from a therapy camp for children with autism, which I worked on in Fermanagh in 2019. The camp offered intensive therapy from art, music, drama and play therapists working alongside occupational, speech and language and behavioural therapists. For him to pay for any sort of home therapy privately, it's it's very very expensive. That's okay. We can change. That's we okay. wouldn't have even considered to get drama therapists freeable or a play or art or, 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 play or <laughs> art therapist because we yeah. think, well, how's that relevant table? You know, we obviously thought you know, speech and language or an occupational therapist to do a sensory needs, but because the, you have five days with five very specialised individuals, you get well over a year's worth of therapy in one week. To have all those people coming together and to feed in, and it just brought him on it's like you wouldn't believe. You want to go to the toilet? Mabel has so many what would be construed as negative responses to things, you know, whenever he's trying to communicate because that's how he knows that he can get our attention. You have people who can cut through all that and can actually see the wee boy. And I remember being in floods of tears because they were like, he is, you know, he is such a smiley, happy wee boy. And you just think, nobody else has ever said that to me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Heather, I'm going to pass it back over to you. No problem. Thank you so much, Maeve and Louise. I know we had a couple of technical difficulties there. So anything that was um, missed in that, we will get as much information as we can and send it over in the email afterwards. But now I'm going to pass you over to Julie Birchie and Carl Sibbett for art therapy. Hello, thank you. I am Julie Birchie. I currently work for CAMS, a child and adolescent mental health service. Um, so I'm going to show a video. I'm going to, I'll just get set up first of all, to make sure it works. And uh, here we go. So I currently work in a multidisciplinary team um, that consists of mental health nurses, psychologists, social workers, and art therapists. I just really wanted to highlight before I play the video, that there's a real richness that those diverse backgrounds can bring to a service. Our initial assessment is called a choice assessment. Um, it's very much patient-led 
And it's about giving the patient and their family input into the treatment. And I think creative therapies can really meet the needs of some of our more difficult to engage patients, such as those with learning and communication problems, or those who are just not ready to engage in the more talking therapies. So I'll play. So there's two um, art therapists employed by the Western Health and Social Care Trust at the moment. And we've created a, a video that I'm going to play for you now. So hopefully it works. Oh, that's great. Hi, my name is Brendan O'Neill. I graduated as an art therapist in 2005 and have been employed as an art therapist with the Western Health and Social Care Trust since 2007. I am currently based at the Throne of Manor Hospital working on adult mental health, offering one-to-one -one art therapy sessions to community clients with enduring mental health problems. Clients are referred by other professions such as nurses, OTs, CBTs, social workers and GPs. I also host group sessions at the ASHA Centre attached to the hospital, a regional detoxification unit. I'm Julie Virtue. I am a HCPC registered art psychotherapist employed by the Western Health and Social Care Trust. Previously, I've provided art therapy sessions to both adult and children, privately and through charity and voluntary organisations. I currently work as a mental health practitioner for CAMS the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. Art therapy is a form of psychotherapy that uses art media as its primary mode of communication, giving expression to those who have difficulty in talking about their thoughts, feelings and issues. It differs from other psychological therapies in that it is a three-way process between the client, the therapist and the artwork. Clients who refer to art therapy do not need to possess any previous experience in art making. Aesthetics and diagnostic assessment are not the primary concerns of the art therapist, but rather the aim of the practitioner is to effect change and growth on a personal level through the use of art materials. The art therapy session normally lasts for one hour, with the clients committing to an agreed contract of at least six sessions. Quite often the young people that I encounter do not have the capacity to put words to their feelings or to what they have been through. Art therapy allows them to access help and support in a non-confrontational way that feels natural to them. It can allow for insight and can help put words to experiences, but it can also be non-verbal and still provide positive therapeutic outcomes. It is not simply art making. There is a therapeutic relationship present that provides safety and unconditional support. As with any therapy, it is geared towards achieving therapeutic goals. Art therapists are qualified to master's level. They are trained in therapeutic theory and also have expert knowledge in the healing qualities of the creative process. Art therapists are found in a wide range of settings, such as forensic, mental health centres, hospitals, education settings and in private practice. Art therapy is for anyone from the very young to the elderly. Art therapy is powerful, it is about authentic expression. It allows us to reframe our experiences through the use of art and metaphor. After I went to art therapy, I felt more confident with trying new things. In art therapy, I get to be still, calm and pensive. It allows me to express myself in my own way. Our therapy was lots of fun and helped me to learn how to cope with my feelings. Art therapy is a great way to express your feelings on paper. It's very peaceful and helpful. I am grateful for that hour of peace from the outside world. That is very charming. I get my feelings out of my head and it makes me feel calm when I draw on a paper. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to pass over to Carol now, the other art therapist. Hi, Julie. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, I'm going to try just and share my screen now as well. Um, so I'm a, an art psychotherapist. I've been 
uh, involved with art therapy for almost 30 years and um, I'm involved with lecturing on the MSc Art Psychotherapy course at Ulster University. I've also worked with the Belfast Trust uh, and also supervise a practitioner who's working with the Belfast Trust in adult mental health and CAMS. And uh, in the past, I've worked a lot in, in hospitals and cancer care and acute mental health settings and trauma settings, etc. So I'm going to just put it into context. Art therapy in Northern Ireland um, was introduced by uh, Rita Simon as a profession in Northern Ireland in, in the early 1950s. Uh, and she worked in Knockbracken, uh, where indeed the master's course went on to, to, to be hosted for a while. And she also worked in various other settings. And she, in 1964, she was also a founding member of BAT, our UK Learn Society. And she uh, also then returned to Northern Ireland because she was, she was based in England at times. In the 1969, uh, uh, for, for Tuesday's time for the creative processes to come back to Northern Ireland. And right through, the, right through into the mid 80s, she worked with children, adults and elderly. And she inspired the founding of the Northern Ireland Group for Artist Therapy, which is a local charity, which has been running, promoting arts therapies since 1976 particularly art therapy and all creative processes. It's been running annual summer schools since 1993 and it was also a key champion in getting the master's art therapy course up and running. So um, HCPC has, has a, a campaign, What, what, why hire an arts therapist or why hire an art therapist? So we're going to look a little bit at that. Obviously, we're HCPC registered, as has been mentioned, um, which aims to give protection of the public through its standards, which we adhere to. We also have the two legally protected titles, art psychotherapist and art therapist, and they are largely used interchangeably. We have our clinical supervision on CPD, which is mandatory, and we have generally our own professional indemnity. So we are a, a regulated profession. We also offer a specialist practice. Uh, as has been said, no prior skill is needed by the clients, but uh, expertise and high levels of skill are needed by the art psychotherapist. We bring an art specialty with therapeutic processes. Many processes that are uh, common in art therapy would be obviously the use of the visual, multi-sensory processing, symbolization, co- and self-regulation, bilateral processing, both sides of the body can be an act active art making process, soothing, rhythm, ritual, memory, reframing, meaning making, story making, metaphor, containment. One of the benefits of, of art process is that it also is tangible. The product is made generally and tends to endure over time. Therefore, that allows reviewing the art process, which offers an overview um, where a whole series of images or objects that have been made can be viewed at once, often offering very reflective uh, opportunities. We also bring skilled ex psychotherapeutic expertise and we also are, uh, through our placements, very skilled in working in multidisciplinary team settings. Art therapists, one of the, I think one of the main things about art therapy is that it's so adaptable and flexible. It features a range of visual, multi-sensory, non-verbal and verbal processes. And uh, we are able to work with all ages because we're not uh, confined to language. Uh, we are able to work with, as soon as somebody is able to make a mark or make a, make a mess with hands or feet, we're able to work with that process with young children and also right through to, to elderly care. So we're often able to work with key issues like dementia and um, as well as physical conditions. We offer a breadth and depth of application across all the tiers. Art therapy can be kind of light touch, um, more about promoting well-being, uh, and it can also be used to uh, restore well-being where there's acute problems or complex problems. We work in diverse formats, one-to-one, -one, various types of groups, indoor, outdoor. We have uh, environmental arts therapies and eco practice as part of our modality. We obviously offer a, a multimedia approach. We use clays, pa paints, pastels, a wide range of arts materials, including find objects, three-dimensional processing, play processes, outdoors work, nature. Um, we're also um, particularly, sadly, at this time, refining our, our skills in telehealth and online practice and digital artworks and, and 
the future is also in virtual reality processing and art. We're highly skilled, as has been said, at engaging hard, to, what might be termed sometimes hard to reach clients, those who perhaps can't easily express verbally for various reasons, things that are deemed to be unspeakable or sometimes felt, felt to be unhearable or unseeable, where we're at a loss for words, where things are deemed to be too painful or too wonderful or shameful or, or difficult. It lends itself to working with trauma and grief and, and bodily issues. It's also useful for people who, who may perhaps overuse words to rationalize or defend against emotions or thoughts. We offer a safe and effective evidence-based practice. We are trained in risk management to manage the risks, uh, to look at contraindications where art therapies may not be possible, and particularly to manage the therapeutic risks that uh, need to be looked at, as well as trained in safeguarding. We offer a trauma-informed approach that's strengths-based. We operate within the biopsychosocial paradigm and we offer a therapy that is client-centered and relational. And absolutely, we uh, are committed to collaborative co-production work with clients. We also offer evidence-based. We're very research-informed. We draw on research from a diverse range of, of contemporary fields, including neuroscience. We are trained from master's level in quality assurance and clinical governance. We promote the use of routine systematic evaluation of practice through outcome and alliance measures, audit and research. And some of that has, has evidenced a, a recent project that I was involved in a, in a secure forensic setting for adults with mental health problems and suicidality. Um, we evaluated that project and found statistically significant improvement across all participants even in a short project. We've also been recommended by NICE uh, for working with psychosis and schizophrenia in adults. Just, I'm going to just share some images for a moment to ex some of the things that we would explore when we're working with our students and with clients in the MSC art psychotherapy. We also include creative processing as part of our learning. It's how art therapists think and feel and, and do. So we, in, in, this is some of the artwork that the uh, students would make or aspects that they would be processing some of their own experience of working with clients through. And these are some of our students um, who, as you can see, became Vikings for a day. Uh, we're processing the, the, the diversity of the spectrum of artists, scientists. How are we clinically creative? and also in a scientific way. The MSC Art Psychotherapy was, um, the training in Northern Ireland was originally established in 2002 uh, and I led it from that time, it, uh, helped by a team of very dedicated art therapists, including Eileen McCourt, who I know is in the audience, uh, who also has, was a pioneer of art therapy in Northern Ireland, along with Rita Simon. And it ran in Queens for some years and then it migrated to have a home in the Belfast Trust. And then in uh, roughly 2018, we also migrated again to have a, a new academic home in the Ulster University. And the orientation of the training in the MSC Art Psychotherapy is trauma informed uh, and an integrative approach to, to art psychotherapy. We have approximately 44 students in any, at any given time. And uh, we have placements throughout a wide range of areas in the trusts and health and social care, education, forensic settings, community. We also have cultural and ecological um, nature based placements through museums and we're in involved in, in the area of developing area of social prescribing. And there's links if people want to, to look up ideas about the course. We obviously are HCPC approved and we also align to our professional bodies. Uh, standards and ethics, BAT, the British Association of Art Therapists. The current director of the course, because I semi sort of retired last year, or, uh, is Dr. Pamela Whitaker. So she would be happy to hear from anybody for who's interested in the training. And yes, we would love to make more collaboration with uh, wider pl placements and wider uh, potential employment settings. Our professional body uh, provides a range of, uh, wide range of information around research in art therapy and also uh, a section on YouTube and on its webpage around ex expressing and sharing anonymized 
service users' experiences. So you can go in there and look at videos of, of clients sharing some of their experiences of art therapy. Just to share some words that I have experienced in my process, so some of these words come from the recent forensic setting, some come from cancer care settings, and some come from acute and complex mental health settings. And these are direct quotes from qualitative um, uh, feedback as well as the quantitative feedback that we would gather. Words can't do justice to how I feel. So work like this is paramount to me, feelings and things that I just can't get out verbally. I felt empowered active in my own care, boosted my self-esteem, better relationships, hope. I, was able, I remember the woman who said that, I was able to find hope in the paint. And then I realized the hope was in me. Better social skills, inner strengths, creative strengths, creative resourcing, creative possibilities. Uh, how to how to build resilience. What happens if the, if the paint splodges in, in, unexpectedly? Maybe I could make a dragon of it. Maybe I could make something out of it. Creative problem solving. Understanding myself better. A, a man in a, in a cancer care setting made a small clay foot because he talked about the pain that he had in his body. And he took great care in making this foot in clay and was smoothing the clay on the foot, making the toes and the toenails, smoothing and smoothing and smoothing. And then he said to me that, he said, I, I realized that as I was massaging the, 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 the clay, it was helping my, my pain. I felt like I was massaging my own body. Helped me to cope better. It's very important to us to, to work in partnership with clients. So thank you for, for listening and thank you for your interest in art therapy. Thanks, Carol. Um, and thanks so much to, to all of our speakers. Um, I am just going to um, speak for a few minutes just to conclude the session today. Um, all right, maybe is it onto the other screen? Can everybody see that okay, that slide, yeah? Brilliant. Um, I hope those presentations have given and um, given everybody a bit of a, a flavour of the way we work and, and, and I'm sure parallels can be drawn between those examples that, that we've been able to give today and sort of other similar clinical areas that we work in. Um, just going to finish with a few words um, about the sort of potential of these uh, professions um, to, to work in health and social care in Northern Ireland in the future. As therapies, our, our approach is holistic and person-centered. We can integrate psychological support with support for sort of the medical condition itself. And the service user is always at the heart of how we approach and design our interventions. Our approach is also compassionate and collaborative. It's based on listening, on meeting the person where they are, um, on working within their preferred communication method uh, and so on. Our approach is also strengths-based and asset-based. So we work with and build on what a person can do, what their strengths are and where they are most engaged and motivated. <laughs> the clinical evidence base for, the, for our professions is, is solid and is growing um, with an increase in quantitative and mixed methods research as well as qualitative evalu evaluations. Informed choice is, is important to consider. Um, it's about helping people access the right service for them at the right time. Um, for example, in mental health services, there needs to be a choice of therapies in, in services. It's important to allow people to make an informed choice over how they approach their recovery. And so it's important to make sure that the pathways are in place to be able to access the arts therapies when they are needed or, or preferred, which isn't currently the case. Um, being uh, working outside of specific languages and culture, this is a really key point um, related to the arts therapies. The arts therapies don't privilege the use of language in their treatment approaches. Therapy isn't based on a verbal interaction, and this means that a much, much wider range of people can be treated in a very immediate way. It wouldn't be that unusual for a therapy session to take place without a single word spoken. Um, and if you think about all of the people for whom it is difficult to access verbal communication for various reasons, in various clinical areas. For example, um, some children and adults with learning disabilities and autism, people who've had strokes or acquired brain injuries or other neurological conditions, 
in mental health, for example, people who find it difficult to express themselves verbally will struggle to engage in talking therapies. And that could include children, older people, I mean, could include any of us really. It might be related to their mental health condition or to a trauma that they might have experienced. Um, overall, this is a really significant proportion of our population for whom just accessing healthcare services of any kind is a challenge. And by using the modalities of the arts for therapy to take place, we can very quickly and effectively have them actively engaged in therapeutic treatments to support their recovery. Um, as such, the arts therapies are both highly accessible and highly motivating and engaging forms of treatment, which can enhance well-being at the same time as being a curative recovery-based clinical treatment. Um, there's evidence from other parts of the UK that the involvement of arts therapies and multidisciplinary teams significantly, significantly improves service user outcomes. By being embedded within or better integrated into multidisciplinary teams, we can support and work with colleagues, provide training or professional advice to a much wider group of staff and establish true collaborative and partnership working between the arts therapies and other health and social care colleagues. We represent three of the 13 allied health professions um, and we have approximately 90 or so registered, trained, highly skilled therapists in Northern Ireland already. The establishment of training courses in Northern Ireland for music and for drama therapy would further serve to grow and strengthen those professions and their links with other allied health professions and health and social care colleagues. Um, we know that the Northern Ireland health and social care system is undergoing a period of transformation in response to the challenges it faces. And the need for an integrated, well-supported, adaptable and resilient workforce has never been greater. At a time when the health service is under such immense, immense pressure, we can play a role in its transformation and its rebuild um, and help to address the waiting lists and the workforce pressures that are there. Um, and lastly, and, and probably most importantly, um, demand for the arts therapies from service users and from the general population is consistently high. Service users highly rate these forms of therapy and the benefit that they get, get from them. Improving access to these therapies across the whole of Northern Ireland will improve service user outcomes. And innovative service design in the future of health and social care in Northern Ireland can see these three professions being used finally to their full potential. Um, I have put on my last slide here some contact details, and these are contact details for um, the three professional bodies, um, um, the British Association for Music Therapy, for Art Therapy and for Drama Therapy. Um, if you would like to, to get in touch and find out any further information or be, in, be put in touch with um, therapists in your area. Um, I have put, we'll share this information out afterwards as well, but I have put a couple of references for suggested reading. They're, those are both reports which are, are very wide um, and they sort of cover the whole scope of arts and health um, right through to the arts therapies. Um, but they're a really good starting point in terms of, of the role that, that the professions can play and a really good reference for evidence base as well. And then lastly, just a small plug there at the end for the, the British Association for Music Therapies uh, conference, which was supposed to be in Belfast last April. Um, it was going to be held at Queen's in April 2020, but unfortunately, of course, we had to cancel. So it's now going to be a uh, an online Belfast conference um, on the 9th to the 11th of April. So there's the link there just in case anybody's interested in that. Um, we have a little bit of time for um, any questions. Um, and I'm going to hand back over to, if you want to have any questions or anything that you'd like to ask us about, feel free to put those into the chat. And I'm going to hand it back over to, to Heather. Hello. Yeah, I've been looking through the, the conversation. It's such a lovely conversation that's happening and lovely to see everyone's reactions to the presentations and thank yous. Um, there have been a few questions, but most of them have actually been answered within the chat. Um, so if there's any others um, that are on the tip of your tongue right now, go for it and we'll get to them now. Um, if not, whilst you're doing that, I just want to remind you of the social media um, handle, hashtag, hashtag clinically creative. And if you want to put any of your experience of today's event up on, the, on your social media, that would be fantastic as well. And I just see that Jenny has put in our contacts into the chat so you can get them easily there. Um, I see, is there any hope for a drama therapy training course in Northern Ireland? Um, yes, there's hope for it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, not, it's not exactly happening as yet, um, 
but it is something that's on the back burner and definitely people are working on it behind the scenes. So, and it's something I'm very, very passionate about creating as well, like the next generation of drama therapists, um, because there needs to be more of us as well um, in order to fulfill our full potential in the healthcare system. So, um, yeah, and then, oh, there's lots of things being said here. Is there any evidence about FUSC efficiency in working with personality disorders? Does anyone want to take that, any of the speakers? Hi, if I can say, yes, there's a, there's a lot of evidence coming through. Uh, Professor Peter Fonicky is working with BAT, has worked with BAT in the past to look at evidence around the use of arts-based uh, approaches in art therapy, mentalize, what's called mentalization-based approaches in art therapy with people with uh, personality disorders. So if you um, you could check in with BAT or we could send you some details on that if you're if you want to email us. But Peter Fonick is doing a lot of a lot of high level research on this. Lovely. Yeah, men Carol, this might be another one for you. Um, I'm applying for the MSc in art therapy and haven't been able to gain a thousand hours of practical experience. Does would this stand in my way? Um, well, obviously, every every application is based on the application, but I would say that in these times there will be all sorts of ex ex exceptional circumstances going on. So please, please apply. Please contact the the tutors and have a chat. Don't don't rule yourself out. How apply? And I th I would think that there would be opportunities to waive some of the aspects of the normal requirements. We also have, can we ask what, can I ask what is the next step maybe after today in terms of making the case for creative therapies? Um, someone else jump in on this, but I'm just going to say there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, can I say you know. something? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Is, is that Louise? Yes. Yeah. Hi, yeah, Louise. I, yeah. On the subject of evidence, when you're a really small profession, like I noticed in Northern Ireland, there's seven drama therapists. We get left out of the research. We haven't got any funding. It's really difficult. And the only way to change that is for all of us to take that responsibility on and not to imagine that some magical unicorn is gonna arrive out of the sky and give us the evidence base we need. Reading around the subject, as I have done, I do my research without any funding at all. I've discovered so many links to neuroscience that absolutely chime with my practice. I mean, we use the same language. So, so there are always going to be ways and the world is changing. And certainly where I work, we work alongside CBT. We realize that CBT is the main uh, approach. But often the people I work with aren't ready for CBT. And they just can't do it. And actually what we've realized is often drama therapy is doing CBT, but it's externalizing it. So I think there's a lot that we can all take responsibility for in any small way in collecting data. Lovely, thank you. We also had the question, I've lost it now, but it's what's the next steps in promoting the creative arts therapies in Northern Ireland. I think we'll take one more after this and then it'll be time to go. Um, I was going to say, Heather, probably one of the biggest next steps would be the, the training, um, because I think, um, you know, the training obviously helps to promote the profession, um, you know, three links with the university, three links with the other AHPs who are training. Um, and then through obviously clinical placements. I saw um, Paul earlier made a, a comment about having more students on, on clinical placements in health and social care settings, which I think would make a, a massive difference as well. Um, I think that's probably the, 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 the one single biggest step that would, make a, that would make a big difference, you know, on top of sort of all the, the, the advocacy that, that we all already do. Absolutely, and yeah to I think that is a massive massive point we don't have a course here in drama therapy and 
Um, yeah, that, that, like I said, that is the next kind of step in, in advocacy of drama therapy. Um, apart from that, we just need to keep communicating, keep working, keep writing and keep raising awareness. Um, that would be, unless anyone else wants to say anything. Okay, one last question that I see here. Are there any online music therapy accredited courses available? Jenny or? Um, no, um, as in the, the, the courses that are accredited and recognized by the HCPC are um, the Masters in Music Therapy courses, um, which as we've, as we've said a few times, um, there isn't one in Northern Ireland currently. There is a course in uh, Limerick, in the University of Limerick, which is the only course on the island of Ireland. Um, and then there are, I think it's about seven courses um, in the UK in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, they are there are masters um, university courses, uh, postgraduate courses, and um, some of them are running online at the moment um, due to the pandemic. Um, but whether that will continue, um, I, I, I would suggest contacting the um, the universities directly would be the most the, the best way to find out. I know there are students at the moment who are, for example, and they're doing their clinical placements here in Northern Ireland and following the course in Edinburgh online, um, but whether that will, will stay, because obviously it's not, not an ideal way to study. Um, but the contact details that we gave, um, I mean, we can all um, put people in touch with um, training courses for music therapy and for drama therapy. If you want to use those email addresses, we'd be happy to do that. Okay, I think we might leave it there for today. Um... We will send out extra information and if we can get answers to any other questions that we see that we've missed, um, we'll email those specifically as well. Um, but yeah, just a massive thank you to absolutely everyone who was involved today. Thank you everyone for coming and for listening and being so supportive of us. Um, and yeah, this is just the next step in, in promoting creative arts therapies and um, showing how we can make a positive influence in the HSC in the future. So thank you all so much, everyone. I'll see you soon.